Hello, how is everybody doing today? Can I get some uh, responses via the chat box? Yes, hello, hello. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you, thank you. Yes, very nice, very good. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we should be getting started in a couple of minutes. Still waiting on our presenter to uh, to get situated and log in. So uh, let's, let's be patient with that. While we while we wait for our presenter to uh, get uh, situated, I wanted to just uh, get some feedback from our attendees. Uh, where's everybody from? Uh, what what part of New York State, the U.S., or maybe uh, elsewhere uh, is is everyone from? Excellent, excellent. I see, I see uh, a good, a good uh, assortment of uh, people from different geographies. You know, predominantly uh, in New York State, a lot of New York City. You got some uh, England area, Boston, Massachusetts. I did see one, one, po uh, one entry from Kentucky. That's pretty cool. Uh, my name again is Razi Kassed. I am a project manager here with Eagle View. Also, I am a uh, the, the, the co-chair for the Professional Development Committee. Uh, so we, we've been able to organize uh, pretty consistently a lot of great webinars, and uh, we really are excited with our upcoming webinar uh, from Chris. And, uh, you know, really, really excited with a lot of the attendees and feedback that we've received. Uh, so if you have... Okay, just want to do a mic check here. Does anyone hear uh, Razi speaking? This is Razi speaking. Can I just get a feedback? Do you hear me speaking, everyone? Okay, audio audio is okay now. Okay, excellent. Hi, how you doing, Jan? How's everything, man? Um, so we're still trying to get our presenter uh, squared uh, with his presentation, and I think we should be uh, getting getting uh, situated in the next minute or so. Yeah, add that presentation right there. Uh, you might have to add the PowerPoint or screen share, uh, Chris. Uh, in the meanwhile, again, uh, you know, really excited for for this presentation. I think it's a really great topic, uh, with uh, you know, looking at sort of mapping applications and different tools uh, that that our current presenter will uh, will discuss. Uh, so just give us uh, one minute. Sit tight. Enjoy. Uh, Enjoy the nice lunch, hopefully, uh, for those of you that are currently eating lunch. 
Uh, and uh, we should be getting squared in the next uh, minute or so. Can you guys hear me now? All right, everyone. Uh, again, my name is Razi Kassed. Uh, yeah, I'm a project manager here with Eagle View, uh, also co-chair of the Professional Development Committee with the New York State GI Association. Uh, video and audio is back, yes. I just wanted to confirm with Chris. Uh, Chris looks like he's all situated with his screen, uh, and everything will go from uh, from there. We'll have, we'll have Chris uh, uh, introduce himself and get it right into the presentation. Uh, so uh, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, reminders. Uh, we do plan to have a Q and A session at the end of the presentation, so you can hold off your question, uh, you know, hold to those questions to be answered at the end of uh, today's presentation. In the meanwhile, you know, feel free to uh, send those questions via the chat box as the presentation goes along. If you have something that comes right up at that moment, and then we'll answer it uh, as they cut in the order that they come in. Uh, also, uh, we 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 plan to uh, have. Uh, this recorded and shared via the New York State GI Association website, as well as on our YouTube channel. Uh, so I think we should do a mic check. Of everything, I think you guys hear me well. Uh, let's just do a mic and a video check with our presenter, Chris. Uh, Chris, can you say something just so we check the mic uh, for the audio first? Hi, this is Chris. Um, let me know if you can hear me. Can we get some feedback? Yes, everyone hears Chris? Okay. And then uh, I think uh, video is the next thing. I want to sure that everyone sees his screen. People seem to be saying no, they can't see the screen. Yeah, so I, so I, that's correct. I think also, how about now? How about now? How about now? All right. See, I like our our audience, our attendees. They're really savvy and very helpful. I have to say. Very helpful. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. All right. Without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. Please, uh, please go into uh, your presentation. And thank you again. Thank you again. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Chris Wong. I'm director of NYC Planning Labs, and we are um, we are what we call a digital service delivery team, uh, which we we think is a lot more than just a sort of traditional IT development shop uh, that builds software. Um, we go a little bit bigger than that, and we're trying to actually, you know, produce better outcomes by looking at the, the problems holistically, um, you know, applying user-centered design, applying modern uh, development practices. Um, um, most of what we do is spatial in nature, so, um, you know, it's a lot of that plus a whole lot of really cutting-edge uh, spatial and GIS-style um, mapping um, that's happening in our web applications. Um, so what I'm going to do quickly is just do a, like an about us presentation that talks about the way we work and, and our team's dynamic and just introduces us a little bit. Um, then I'll talk about the spatial stack that we use and then demo a few of the applications that we built in the last, uh, basically about the last two years. Um, so, you know, we frame the, the problem with this slide. Uh, government technology projects tend to take a long time, cost a lot of money, and can be lacking in user experience. And um, if you guys are all government people, uh, you probably experience this sort of thing. Uh, just that, you know, we, we kind of kill these things with meetings instead of actually building real software that people can try. Uh, and we don't iterate well because we usually end up, um, you know, either bidding things out to a, a private contractor, um, you know, that takes 
lots of time gathering money and lots of time gathering resources and specking out the problem uh, and just sort of dumping it all on someone's lap all at once and saying, you know, go build this. And by the time it comes out, uh, it's either not very good because they didn't have designers um, or just doesn't even meet the needs of the users anymore because everything's changed in the last two years. Um, so the antidote to this problem, um, we like to say, is uh, you know, a different approach, which means we can prototype uh, quickly and iterate quickly. Um, so not putting sort of all your eggs in one basket, but, but you know, starting with small bites and um, you know, uh, being able to go in a cyclic matter, manner that uh, explain, basically allows you to make changes quickly and learn from your mistakes quickly. Um, we use free and cheap and open source tools. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll cover some of the platforms that we use to support our work, um, but generally speaking, you know, the, the, the invest, we want to invest more in, in good people um, and, and not spend as much money on software licenses and um, you know, contracts that might be either predatory or just hard to get out of. Um, and then third and, and probably most important is starting with design thinking. And I like to say, um, you know, you go start asking, when you look at a typical government software project uh, and, and you say, like, how many designers worked on that? Um, the answer is usually going to be zero. There's a lot of engineers and there might be product managers, but designers um, tend to be lacking, especially in the government space. Um, so NYC Planning Labs is, is a, a small team here at the Department of City Planning uh, that was established to uh, introduce these three um, sort of main philosophies of using open technology, uh, using agile methodologies, and this is an applying center design. Uh, and these are sort of things that trend in sort of building good digital products uh, in, the, in the rest of the world um, that I think government has been slow to pick up on. And we by no means are the first ones doing this in government. We actually modeled ourselves after uh, 18F and the U.S. Digital Service and sort of uh, plenty of predecessors that have come before us doing this sort of thing. Um, most of the time they are, you know, probably pretty well funded and come with a, a much higher mandate, um, a lot of them happening at the federal level. Um, so we, what we wanted to do here was just say we can do this not even at the state or city level but down in an agency level um, is we can have these kinds of little digital teams building great products. Um, so our core values, uh, and these are on our website, um, are to be open by default to build with and not for, to ship early and ship often, and to document and disseminate. And I think these sort of underpin all of our decision making and all of our planning uh, and basically uh, ensure that, you know, th these are sort of guiding principles that make sure that we are, um, you know, in everything that we do, we want to make sure that people can access it, that we're not, you know, that we're thinking about the users, um, that we are learning and iterating quickly, and that we're actually sharing lots and lots of information along the way, including lessons learned and also just documentation about our products. Um, and we like to say that you know, how we build is just as important as what we build. And um, you know, the, how is, the how is really the big differentiator in, in what Planning Labs does. Um, another thing we like to say a lot is demos, not memos. Uh, or uh, there's a saying that goes, is if the picture is worth a thousand words, then a demo is worth uh, you know, 50, um, 50 uh, PowerPoint presentations uh, showing mockups. Um, so real software is the name of the game here. And continuous delivery of that software is what's extremely important. Um, so we use a lot of open technology, so you'll see some GIS related things on here, um, but specifically Cardo as our primary data store and uh, web APIs for accessing spatial data, and then Mapbox as our, uh, as our primary uh, front end visual layer for um, creating web maps. Um, we do a lot of JavaScript heavy application building here, um, but pretty much everything we use in our software stack is open source. Um, we also have a pretty big footprint on GitHub. Um, so literally every, every line of code written in NYC Planning Labs is published to the web on our GitHub page. Um, and you can, you, know, you can clone our repositories, you can participate in the software development, um, but everything is sort of happening out in the open, uh, which is uh, how I, I think it should be in government. Um, we focus on human-centered design. So again, uh, even with the very small team, we started with three people. Uh, one of those three was you know, explicitly a designer with a background in, in uh, UX design and graphic design and sort of uh, you know, sort of, you know, holistic view of, of design practices. Um, but we, you know, we tend to start our projects with, by locking ourselves in a room with our customer, who's another um, division here at City Planning, and we go through all these design exercises trying to hone in on who the users are of this new software that we're going to build and what they plan to get out of it. Uh, and that will guide all the decisions on uh, what features to build. Um, we're also very agile. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a is a picture of a waffle board. I'm gonna escape here just to make sure everyone can still see me. Um, any issues, I guess let me know in the chat if uh, things are going good. Somebody says speak slowly, which I'm very bad at, so I'm sorry about that. Um, I'll keep... um, so yes, we use uh, an agile methodology 
Um, and it basically means we're on a two week sprint cycle and that's the sort of elemental cycle of our work. Um, so uh, we will pick off a list of things to accomplish during that sprint, um, which is great because you know a few of us can look long term and as a director, I will do that. Um, but for the people actually building, um, it just means you know we can really focus on what are we doing these two weeks and not not have to sort of look at the bigger picture uh, until we need to. Um, and that breaks it down into a small element. Um, so what you'll see here on this board uh, is a to-do column, an in-progress column, and a done column. Uh, and all of these tasks will slide across from to-do into in-progress into done over the course of that sprint. Um, all of them are assigned to an actual person on the team who's responsible for accomplishing that task. Um, and then, you know, at, as we go, we should, I should be able to check in here at any time and see, uh, you know, what's still to do, what's in progress, and what's done. Um, and this just gives you sort of a, a typical workflow for one of our projects. Um, so we start with ideation, uh, we do some design sessions to understand who the user is, um, then we do wireframing, and then we basically do an, as many build sprints as is necessary to, to get a minimum viable product. Um, and most of the time we're, we're trying to get a product out as, sim as, as early as possible. And that's part of that um, ship early, ship often core value is that the best way to build these products is to get them out to as many users as soon as possible and get real feedback from actual people, uh, not just test them internally for, you know, forever. Um, and so our team uh, is me as a director. Uh, Andy and Matt were the original team uh, as a designer and developer. Uh, we now have a product manager. Um, and this is out of date. Uh, so this intern has actually been offered a full-time position, is now a developer. And then we've also filled this last developer position. So we are six people. Um, so um, you guys came here for maps. So I just wanted to get through that kind of quickly and give you some context of who we are and where we came from. Um, and we can jump in and actually look at some of these products right now. Um, who's actually, who's actually seen, well, I guess I can't do a show of hands. I normally do a show of hands. Who's used Zola before? This is probably our flagship product. Um, when we first started, uh, this was something that was very high on the list of, uh, you know, software that existed in the agency, but not organization. Um, the whole point of Zola is to just allow any New Yorker, um, who has an interest in, um, uh, zoning and land use to understand, uh, what regulations acquire, what regulations apply to their property. Um, so what I can do here is I can start typing in 120. Broadway, um, and I don't want to gloss over this, but we actually have like a modern search, uh, and, and to do this, we actually had to build a, um, a geocoding API on top of the city's official address data that we stood up on our own. Um, but this allows us to do this sort of autocomplete uh, Google Maps style lookups where we can actually just start typing 120 BRO, and I'll get all these different matches that, that resemble that text string. Um, so I'm going to type 120 Broadway, which is the, the city planning office. And you'll see what just happened here is that the map uh, zoomed into our location and we also have this little profile on the side uh, that gives us some very critical information. Um, so if you're familiar with the New York City Pluto data set, um, all this information is basically core information coming from Pluto about this lot. Um, so we can see the ownership type is private. Uh, we can see who the owner is. Uh, we can see what its land use is according to the Department of um, Finance. Uh, we can see it has a building class for condominiums and office space. Um, and then we can also link out to various other systems that track things at the BBL level or the block lot or a block lot level. Um, so it's just a really wealth of information at your fingertips. Um, one other thing you might notice is that the, the URL up here actually changed. So um, the URL actually says uh, 1 slash 47 slash 7501, which is the borough code block and lot for this property. And uh, what that has allowed us to do is basically make a routable URL for every tax lot in New York City. Um, and these are easily shareable and you can just send them out to, to anyone in an email and they'll come back and see this exact profile. Um, so some of the other things you can do in Zola, and you'll see that as I zoom out, um, the zooming is very fluid because we're using vector-based uh, map tiling. Um, so this is all rendered using Mapbox GL, which is an open source uh, software library for making um, vector-based web maps. Um, and then behind the scenes is Cardo. Uh, providing a spatial data store that serves up all of the, the content for these like zoning districts and for the subway layers. Um, but I can come over here and say, I want to turn off the subways. So this is more GIS style um, adding of layers. So I can say, you know, show me all the historic districts and let's turn off the zoning. And you can see now I've got a nice map of historic districts with commercial overlay still visible. Um, so, you know, tons of, tons of new layers and we're constantly adding new ones. Um, I can show special purpose districts. I can show 
where sidewalk cafes are allowed. Um, so all of this information is by the Department of City Planning, um, but this app kind of brings it all together into one one place so that if you are you know, the owner of this property, um, you can get real context with useful spatial data about which zones your property is located in. Um, so that's Zola. Um, I can show you another one. This is our first project as, as a new team. Um, this is called Community Profiles. Um, so the, the goal of this product uh, is to basically empower New York City's community boards with relevant data um, that's already sort of pre, pre-snipped and pre-aggregated at their level of context. Um, so if you go ask a New Yorker on the street, what community board do they live in? Um, most of them probably can't tell you, um, but they do know their address. So one of the things that we came up with when we were doing the design work on this is not, not just saying pick your community district, um, because that's hard for people to do. Um, but like I said, again, if I type in 120 Broadway um, in this search field, it's actually going to tell me which community district each one of these address results is in. So if I, were, if I lived here, which I can't because it's not a residential building, uh, I would know that I'm in Manhattan Community District 1. Um, and that'll take me straight to this profile. Um, so right now the URL changed and it says Manhattan 1. And you can see that we are uh, in the, the profile for, for this area of Manhattan. Uh, and we lead with um, sort of general population information. This all comes from the Census Bureau, either from the American Community Survey or from the decennial census. Um, but this is, a, this is a real number we can you know, very quickly um, use if we're either trying to make arguments or just understand who lives here. Uh, in, in, in 2010, there were 61,000 residents here, uh, and that's up from 34,000 in 2000. That's a massive increase uh, in a 10-year period. Um, and you know, that's a number that has major implications for schools and infrastructure and lots of other decisions uh, that planners need to make for this area. Uh, we also start with a population pyramid showing uh, probably what you would expect for this neighborhood of who actually lives here. Um, in terms of age breakdown, but this is very useful as you explore other parts of the city. Um, and then we also have these sort of comparative indicators. So um, I can see sort of how this community district, Manhattan 1, stacks up against the other 59 or other 58 uh, in every one of these different indicators. So I can see that, you know, we're pretty much on the low end of the scale when it comes to, to people under 18, and we're, you know, somewhere on the low end uh, when it comes to, to senior citizens. Um, same thing for you know access to parks and crime and needing to work and those sorts of things. So we really like this um, this way of explaining the data um, and, and visualizing it. it gives you some instant context to the to the big number you're looking at there. Um, so context is also important. So it's it's uh, you know you'll see here we have a land use and zoning map that follow, um, and this is actually more or less the exact same data and the same technology stack that is showing this information in Zola. Um, so you might look at that and say, you repeated work, why don't you just link to Zola? Um, but context is really important. Um, so, you know, not only are we showing the land use uh, in this area with, with visual colors, but we're actually showing a chart next to it that gives you some real about, um, you know, what percentage of the land area is used for all of these things. So if I were if I were on the community board in this neighborhood, I can come here and actually say, you know, there's real hard data now without having to hire a data scientist or having anyone do data analysis for me uh, or on my behalf. Um, that you know most of this is public facilities and institutions, and then followed by commercial and office space. And I might have thought that commercial and office space would have been first, just based on my my gut. Um, but most of the land area is actually public facilities and institutions. Um, same thing for the different types of zoning. Um, then we also have facilities maps. So we're kind of providing all these different cuts of uh, of you know the the ubiquitous open data for this neighborhood, um, and just putting it all into this nice profile view. Um, and then you can just kind of keep scrolling down and seeing all this great information, uh, including like floodplains, including um, the actual comments from community boards about what they need, uh, and just a wealth of information here. Um, so this replaced uh, what was formerly um, basically a static website um, as part of our agency website. Uh, it's now kind of its own app. It's, it's mobile responsive, uh, has these really rich maps in it, and um, you know it's it's open source. So uh, we've actually had people, you know, from way outside of our agency open up issues on GitHub with feature requests or with corrections or even just asking for clarification about how we got to these data points. Um, and because all of the all of the code is open source, you can see how these charts get defined and sort of where the where the data really comes from. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Um, 
you guys will like this one if you're GIS nerds. Um, so this one looks kind of like Zola, but has a kind of a different context. Um, so a lot of the same layers, but uh, this is called the NYC street map. And um, when you really get down into it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm an urban planner uh, by training, and um, you know, this is a really sort of fundamental question uh, when it comes down to, to what, what cities are, is like, what are streets? Um, and they have names and they're lines, but they're not really lines. They're kind of negative space. They're kind of negative space amongst the private property uh, in the city. Um, and this, you know, the role of this app is to actually define where the legal edges of the streets are, um, and then also give you some context about when and where they've changed. So all these shaded polygons that you see around here are, um, are actually changes to the street grid. And what's really fascinating here is that this, uh, this agency um, has been involved in scanning high resolution prints of these engineering drawings that show when we're going to make a new street or we're going to close down streets. Um, so I can click on this and actually see that there is something that happened here in 1957. Um, and if I click on that PDF, it's actually going to load in a new tab. And I can see that they actually added this, uh, they added this court uh, right here in the middle of a block back in 1957. Um, some of these are just downright beautiful and I want to print them out and frame them. Um, but there's thousands of these that are now online as a, as a result of this map. Um, and I'd say that's its probably primary purpose is to make, um, basically to serve as an index for all of these different maps and to visualize uh, the best effort we have now for, for where the streets are. Uh, and you'll see over here these things that say something like unmapped street or um, street treatment or map street. A map street basically just means that it is legally defined. Uh, and then there are unmapped streets that uh, that may not actually be legally defined, but the city treats them as a street. Uh, and there's a whole lot more nuance to that. There's also a lot of private driveways that everyone thinks are, pu are, are public, but they're really not. Um, and that has implications for who maintains them and that sort of thing. Um, so this is a great resource uh, for people who need to do sort of historical research and figure out um, you know, when the street grid changed in a certain place. Um, so for here, for example, underneath the mouse pointer is something from 1965, 62, and 76. And again, I can open up the PDF and just take a quick look at, at what happened here. Um, so there's people who have much more expertise than me that can actually decipher this and, and help explain why it's, uh, why it's really important. But um, that is NYC Streets. Um, and uh, last but not least, actually, I don't know if this will be last, but um, this is a product called Zap Search. And um, this one we're very proud of because uh, basically a complement to an internal um, information system here at the Department of City Planning um, that's actually not spatial. And, I, and they, they came to us and said, we need a really killer sort of public um, filtering and search utility. So basically what you're looking at here on the right side is zoning actions. Uh, these are um, basically people who want an exception to the zoning rules or want to actually do a rezoning. Um, this will actually include city-led rezonings. Um, but some rezonings actually just happen uh, when communities get together or private owners get together. Um, but each one of them goes through this process in New York City. And the goal of this app is to help you understand what has happened and what is ongoing happening right near you. Um, so it was really exciting because we actually were able to add spatial component to this. So uh, from, from my perspective, I think this is one of the best uh, sort of lookup, you know, public information lookup interfaces um, for, for a database. Um, but basically what I can do here is um, turn on, say I only want to look at things in you know, Brooklyn Community District 1. Um, so I filtered that uh, and you can see the map. The map and the, the list will actually complement each other and they're always up to date. Um, so I can either click on these things on the map or hover over them and see what the names of these different projects are. Um, or I can actually choose from the list, but I can continue filtering. So right now this is only showing me the things that are currently filed or are currently in public review. Um, but if I want to look at sort of the historical picture, um, I can click on completed. And this is every zoning action that has happened in this community district since the, uh, I guess, I think since the 70s is when we started uh, tracking this sort of information. So you can see there's 488 of them. Um, and if I were to live, you know, if I live somewhere around here and wanted to see what had actually happened on my block, I can click on it. Um, so this takes me to the, the, the profile view for this zoning action. Um, and we're really proud of this sort of milestone view. Uh, it kind of breaks this really complicated process down into a much simpler visual timeline um, that starts with the application being filed. Um, and then every step of the way, the community board gets to review it. The city planning commission gets to review it. There's a vote. Uh, and then the very last step is a, 
approval letter sent to responsible agency, meaning that you know some some decision was actually made. Um, and we're linking these out to the reports. So let's see if this will load a report for us. Um, actually, I think this is a this is just a separate search app, um, but you can actually look up the document that the the, the city planning commission um, you know wrote as their official ruling on this. Um, we have where possible, we have vector geometries to actually show uh, which one of these, you know, which which buildings or tax lots or sort of what geographic area was affected by this um, was affected by this decision. Uh, we know the blocks and lots, and um, as we always try to do, wherever there's a block and lot, we want to link back to Zola so you can learn more about that block and lot. Um, so I can like click on this block and lot and go back to Zola. So it's really fun to be building all these different open source tools, um, and they're all on the web, but they all can kind of link to each other. Uh, and make make surfing all this you know complex uh, planning information much easier. Um, so that's great. Um, so we can go back to the search view. Again, this is mobile responsive, but I think the the crowning achievement here is actually adding um, adding spatial data to a core data set that is not inherently spatial. Um, so it basically meant that we're building a kind of separate uh, separate database of points and and polygon geometries associated with each project, and then blending those three things together. Um, to power this application. So it's a kind of perfect example of like a hybrid hybrid app that pulls data from two different places, puts it all together, and then makes it presentable to the user in a really great user interface. Um, and then very last but not least, um, this one called Metro Region Explorer. This one is actually much more GIS aligned. Um, you know, it's, it's not such a flashy application, um, but it is presenting a lot of, a lot of regional data um, and I think you know the 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 big takeaway with this application is that you know this data uh, is actually very hard to come by at the regional level, uh, and we tend to sort of live in these um, silos that follow the boundaries of our political um, you know political alignments and political uh, jurisdictions. Um, so taking a regional view can be often difficult um, because you know New York City and New York State may track data differently than Connecticut and New Jersey do. Um, so we have an actual entire team here at the department uh, dedicated to regional planning. Uh, and instead of putting all this information into a uh, you know, PDF or something, they wanted to make something a little more uh, lively and exciting. Um, so I can look at all of these different profiles um, at the subregion, county, or municipality level. Um, for example, if I want to click this, uh, this municipality in New York State, actually I need to get off the main page and go to one of the sub pages. So, Let's say we want to look at housing. So we've got a bunch of housing theme maps here. Um, so housing units permitted uh, 2010 to 2016. So again, very much uh, GIS-like, um, but I can switch to municipality view and actually get a nice little pop-up with some some key factor, you know, key indicators on um, this housing units permitted uh, uh, variable. Um, so you know, we can see that there were only 13 units permitted in uh, the this six-year period. Um, versus 6,000 in the county and versus 12,000 in the mid Hudson region. Um, and again, they've got people, housing, and jobs, um, but you can just sort of a wealth of information um, sort of presented in a way where you can sort of surf around and look at it so it's not quite as, uh, you know, quite as boring as sort of scrolling down through like a 50 page PDF. Um, and you can actually switch back and forth easily between these things and share the links, which is great. Um, they also added uh, they wanted to you know, show regional rail lines and then also give you the ability to switch to aerial imagery. Um, so, and all of this is a uh, you know, custom built front end application uh, using open source uh, tools and libraries um, to, to get all this data onto the page. Um, so I have another slide that I brought up just because I, so we're done sort of showing the, the applications themselves. And uh, this is, this is kind of a, very simple overview of the spatial stack that we're actually using to build these uh, applications. Um, so the most part on the bottom of the screen you see here is uh, these are Ember JS applications. So Ember is a, our front end framework of choice. Um, we're building what are called single page applications, uh, which basically means when you change routes in the front end, um, it doesn't cause a flash in your browser to actually load a new page. Um, it just basically is changing the layouts programmatically and then getting new data from the server um, you know, behind the scenes. Uh, and it creates a much more seamless um, seamless interaction uh, from the user's perspective because they're not constantly clicking on things and waiting for a page to reload. Um, it's basically making web applications behave uh, a lot more like the um, mobile applications you have on your phone. Um, so behind the scenes, um, in-house, we basically have uh, Cardo, 
which is our primary data store, and that's a PostGIS based database with a bunch of uh, web APIs built around it. Um, so that gives us the ability to query both raw data um, out of any data set that we put in it, uh, and also to pull out vector tiles, which is what we use for all the presentation of spatial data. Um, we also build a lot of custom Express APIs. Um, so that's a, a JavaScript um, web framework. It's really easy for us to you know, dream up um, dream up an API endpoint in the morning and we'll deploy it in the afternoon and start consuming it immediately. Um, we also use a technology called Open Map Tiles, and that is uh, based on OpenStreetMap data, but it is a an open source uh, vector tile server, which allows us to pull a snippet of OpenStreetMap data and then serve up vector tiles for it. So when you look at our apps, um, oops, where did I go? Okay. Uh, when you look at our apps, um, all this sort of base map, what you would consider a base map, which is the street names and the you know, this green space for a park and the building footprints and all that sort of thing. Um, this comes from OpenStreetMap via uh, OpenMap tiles. Um, like I said earlier, we also built our own geocoding API. Um, so that's called GeoSearch. Um, we've had, that's probably the most used web service that we built to date. And it is, uh, you know, heavily used in all of our apps. It's kind of the first thing people go to. Our analytics will show you know, the first thing people do when they land on one of these things is, is search so they can go find their, their neck of the woods because New York City is so big and they want to know what's happening on my block, on my street, or my property. Um, and then we also consume lots of third-party APIs. Um, so uh, all of the aerial imagery in Zola, for example, comes from uh, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. Uh, and they publish, you know, they publish these, these uh, tile services that anyone can consume without an API key. Um, so it was a cinch to sort of bring all these in. We just had to build some UI around toggling them and stuff like that. But the, the data sets themselves for actually serving, serving all the different multi levels of aerial raster data going back to the 20s um, all came from Do It, and we didn't really have to lift a finger to make any of it exist. It was already just there and published. Um, so that was wonderful. Um, and then we also use Cyclomedia, uh, which is kind of a Street View clone, um, but New York City actually contracts with a, a private entity to do a much more frequent uh, and higher quality um, snapshot of the streets. Um, so if you go into Zola, you know, and go to a tax lot, you can actually see a, a Cyclomedia, which is, you know, Street View, similar Street View service. Um, so that's our stack. Um, I also want to show you guys, uh, if you want to go to planninglabs.nyc, um, there's plenty of great information on there, but I want to call your attention to um, our blog posts. So like I said, one of our core values is, is to, you know, document and disseminate um, and blogging is how we share, uh, you know, lessons learned. Uh, it's how we share, you know, thing, you know, new changes to our process. Um, it's how we, um, you know, talk about changes in our deployment workflow. Um, so this is one that I wrote uh, last week called Ohio Netlify. Uh, it talks about a Netlify service, which is what we actually use to deploy uh, most of our front end applications. Um, so you can go through and read all this stuff and. You know, we, we just kind of consider ourselves citizens of the, of the web um, and, you know, constantly looking for new ways of doing, uh, new ways and better ways to, to work, um, new tools to use. Uh, and part of, part of all the great information that's out there um, is sort of this, this uh, duty to pay it forward and also share how we're using things and, and make, it, make that information available so that other people can benefit uh, in much the same way that we share code. Um, so it all just sort of, it, it all boils down to these core principles of being open um, and, you know, basically creating these communities and um, points of connection from way outside of our agency um, to make our software better. It makes us better developers and programmers. Uh, it makes, uh, sort of, just makes everything better because of just more eyes, more communication, um, and just sort of more, more um, you know, more people working together for the common good. Um, so you can also see our projects listing on here. Um, so you, know, you can scroll through and see all the different things we've built in the last two years. We've got plenty more great things coming down the pipeline. Um, but I think we're, you know, we're very proud of what we've been able to accomplish with a very small team. And if you go back to that very first slide I showed, you know, we, like, any one of these projects could have been spec'd out for you know, probably millions of dollars um, or, or, or maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but we build them you know, quickly in, uh, in a matter of, you know, sometimes a matter of a few weeks uh, to get them out the door. Um, we also have, you know, maintenance burden that comes with that. Um, so we're, we're dealing with that right now as we grow. Um,
but again, like most of this stuff uh, was actually built by that original team of three, and now we have six uh, sort of helping us maintain and, and build new projects at the same time. Um, so I think it's 1240, and I think uh, we can take some questions now if anyone has them, but I think that's all I've got. Excellent. Uh, excellent. Uh, thank, you, thank you, Chris, for Chris, an excellent, for excellent piece, piece, piece through the details, details uh, both, uh, both on, on uh, the back and uh, back and sort of the, 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 the breakdown of what, breakdown you're, of what using you're using resource tools. Resource tools. So thank you for that. And, uh, and uh, like uh, Chris like mentioned, Chris mentioned uh, please send uh, in, your, send question. in your questions. Okay, is, okay. I just want to confirm, is my audio doing, doing any echo? I can hear you, okay. 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 So, so Chris, I think so, it, Chris, I think in terms of the echo, of the echo might not be able to, be able to deal with that so much. So, how about so you go through the questions and then read them out loud? Or I'll, I'll release them and then you can answer them so that they can be reviewed. Okay, I'm I'm just looking in the chat window, so I don't see any questions unless uh, unless you're hearing something that I'm not. Somebody, uh, Jesse Braden. Hi, Jesse. Uh, are you considering Kepler.gl for anything since it's open source? Uh, I don't think I'm familiar with Kepler.gl, and I'm going to Google it right now. Um, Oh, is this the one that was released by Uber? Anyway, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know. This seems like more of an analysis tool, um, so it's it you know probably seems like uh, like we're not we're not really an analysis team, so um, we're we're generally building applications. Uh, but if there's a if there's an avenue for that, we definitely look into it. Um, but uh, no, I don't think that's something that's looked, that we've come across yet. Okay. Uh, Hidenori Fujimura asks, thanks, Chris. I appreciate your open sourcing your great products and your blog, SNS Outputs. I want to see more public organizations adopt your methodology that involves vector tile technologies. However, it seems to me the adoption of vector tiles are slow in the GIS community in general. Do you have some idea on how your methodology can spread to other public organizations? Um, well, I think, well, actually, I, I would say it's it's pretty important. Um, I, I would say members of this team have a GIS background, and so do I. Um, but I think it's you know important to um, understand that like we are way past sort of desktop GIS, uh, and and I'm sorry, let me let me say this differently. I think there's a there's a general concept in government that spatial is special. Uh, and that it's kind of a separate discipline from anything else that involves data. Um, and we need to get, get beyond that, uh, first of all, and just say, like, spatial, spatial data is a first-class citizen in application development and any sort of data analysis. Um, and I think the sort of new generation of data scientists uh, are, are generally of that, um, of that mindset as well. So, like, when you find somebody who's uh, getting into data analysis and that sort of work, um, spatial is becoming much more relevant to that, and you don't have to take separate special GIS courses. Um, and I actually teach a couple courses at NYU and try and reinforce that. Um, I think you know vector tiles are much more relevant if you're building an application than they are if you're doing um, just normal sort of spatial analysis and that sort of thing. Um, so it just all depends on the use case, but um, I think you know underlying all of that is not saying we should use vector tiles it's much more having uh, the sort of mentality of we should try to find the best tool for the job um, i think you'll end up on that if you end up in the open source world and you want to tinker and iterate quickly you're probably going to end up um, you know adjacent or aligned with with something using vector tiles in short order uh, it's when you're you know that, that this is kind of the way the industry is moving when it comes to visualizing large amounts of spatial data um, we, we've chosen Mapbox GL and Cardo, but there's plenty of other flavors of, of how to get vector tiles onto the screen and do interesting things with them. Can you talk a little, so Kim Fisher says, can you talk a little about how you manage changes that come in through the various 
source data APIs. Um, so that's actually been a point of uh, headache for us um, because we've been, you know, we've like Cardo, Cardo gave us the ability to, to iterate quickly. We didn't really have to build a back end. We just kind of load tables into Cardo and have uh, websites consuming data directly from the Cardo endpoints. Um, data updates have been a pain because we haven't really engineered a good um, automated update pipeline for that sort of thing. Um, so basically, uh, probably on a monthly basis is when it happens most of the time, uh, there'll be a new cut of data from a lot of the sources, especially the ones that come out of the city planning department. Um, and somebody has to just go in and manually upload them. Um, however, we have a lot of code that's pointing to the old tables and we don't want to necessarily just swap out the data. Um, so we're doing like a whole sort of table name, you know, duplicate table names that have a, a timestamp on them. Uh, it's a little clunky and cumbersome, but, uh, you know, still not, not big enough of a problem that we have to engineer an automated pipeline around it and spend a lot more time doing that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I would say that's, that's probably the biggest headache is actually just manually replacing data on our servers and making sure that all the apps are now pointing to the new table names. Um, and we're working on that. We're going to have a much better solution for that soon. Um, is that what you meant by changes that come through the various source data APIs? Um, or, or I guess you might be talking more about, um, you know, when, when a source data set from another agency changes without warning, um, I mean, I think that's just trial and error. It's, it's not quite a bit where, you know, something happens weird in the app and we start doing our investigative work and just realize that this thing, you know, that we thought was a, a string is now a number and it's throwing off some, some function somewhere. Um, it just happens. Uh, so, you know, we work through it, but again, that becomes an issue that's out in the open um, that people can find later uh, if they're having the same issue. Um, but all that stuff is out on the internet, so we can sort of share. So, um, Tao Tang says, thanks a lot. Okay, that's not a question, but you're welcome. Um, any other questions? All right, Brett Kreps says, Chris, what factors drove your choice of front end framework? Why did you select Ember.js rather than Angular or Backbone, for example? Um, so, personally, um, when I came to this agency before Planning Labs was started, uh, I chose to use React for uh, the capital planning platform, uh, which I think is still up, capitalplanning.nyc. Um, so this is a, this this platform predates Labs, um, but uses a lot of the same technologies. Um, but the front end is based in React. Um, when I hired my first developer, um, he I, I was definitely not very opinionated. I just wanted to find something that I could work with that I could use very quickly and cheaply, uh, and just start building. Um, my first engine, my first developer was a little more opinionated about it, and he, and he made very good arguments about why uh, Ember was a better choice than React. Uh, and essentially, it was because React only deals with the view layer, but Ember has, um, you know, very rich and mature sort of data modeling built in, and it also, you know, comes with its own build building system, so you don't have to like write your own Webpack configs. So it's a little more opinionated, but it's less of a free for all than if you're trying to use React and bundle it with a bunch of other things. Um, so that's probably it. Is something that you know not only, uh, yeah, we had a developer who who had a, a very strong opinion of it, um, but also he you know convinced me of why it was better and um, would you know had a great community around it. Uh, probably not as big as React, but that actually works both ways. Um, and you know we started writing our own packages around it, so we actually have you know a, a core dependency on all of our apps that that basically is the middleman between Mapbox GL. And, um, and Ember, uh, which is maintained by us. Um, so Angular and Backbone, um, I you know dabbled with both of them. Like CardoDB's UI was built in Backbone, at least it was a few years ago. Um, and Angular I've messed with, but just you know wasn't didn't didn't really catch on here. All right. So Colin Riley says, uh, coming from the private sector. Has your perception of working in government been what you expected and what changes would you make if you could? Um, yeah, I would say it's probably about what I expected. I, I will say, frankly, I didn't expect. Um, so, I mean, labs was labs was very much uh, a product of a pitch um, of saying, we, you know, we can we can after after sort of getting uh, after after being able to prove the model by building the capital planning platform single handedly using open source. Um, we were able to sort of make the argument that we should scale this up and hire a few more people. 
and and really you know take on some bigger bigger tasks. Um, so I you know I I I just kind of put all those cards on the table and um, expected a much harder slog to make that happen, um, which didn't happen. So that's a testament to the you know, forward thinking leadership in this agent that, that allowed this to exist and also funded it for more people. Um, but uh, you know, typical government stories abound of just sort of there's red tape and there's turf and there's bureaucracy. Um, you know, little things, little things that support the way we operate, which I don't talk about much in the in the presentation, is you know, being able to deploy to cloud servers um, is getting off of the the sort of oppressive enterprise network um, that we we have. That you know, you, you've seen this story a million times where people come in with with skills and they just can't do anything because they can't install. Um, software on their machines or they're, you know, they're killer in a Mac environment, but we use Windows, so you can't do anything. Um, so like we're all on Macs and we're off network and that was a, that was a pretty big hurdle. Um, so, you know, there's that, that stuff still happens. Um, and, you know, the, the changes I would make are, are really just to focus on the values uh, and let everything else follow. Um, and I think another sort of, I don't know if it's a cliche or just a good sort of, you know, thing to follow is, is um, Make the make the right choice the easy choice, um, which is not usually how government's set up. Um, so the, the easy choice is to stick with the status quo, uh, to do the thing that we always did because it comes easiest to us. Um, but you know we, we should make the right choice the easy choice, and that's always very difficult sometimes. Uh, Daniel Hartman says, uh, "How did you develop the Polygon data for Zap?" Uh, good question. Um, so there's actually scripts that are open source if you want to see that, but um, basically each one of these projects has a, a set of borough block and lots, BBLs, uh, basically tax lots associated with it. Um, so uh, because because the actual geometries of those are not tracked historically, I mean they kind of are because you can go get historical versions of Pluto, um, the best effort um, at this point was to basically take all those BBLs and run them through modern Pluto. Um, and which we know is problematic because BBLs come and go. Some of them don't exist anymore. Some of them get combined with other lots. Um, but for the most part, uh, most of the time, um, taking the BBLs on projects uh, going back to the 70s and comparing them um, and getting vector geometries from Pluto is good enough. Um, and then we've built in a, you know, it's a separate table that we maintain now. So it's not like we're pulling from Pluto in real time. Um, so we have that archive, archive and we now have you know, some means in place where if somebody can flag something and say that it's wrong, um, you, we could add a new geometry for that for a lot, a lot that no longer exists or was combined with another lot. Um, and, and frankly, like what we're actually showing for each one of the Zap features doesn't necessarily have to be a tax lot. It's just a geometry that best describes that action. Um, so whether it's coterminous with tax lots is not really that big of a deal, I think, for the for our customer. Um, it's just more for you know, can the can the user of this thing understand what was affected by that action? Um, okay, Ryan Cooper says, the work you all are doing at NYC Planning Labs is amazing and I wish we were doing something similar in our organization. That's not likely to happen soon here, but do you have any recommendations uh, individuals in a large org can take to promote openness, innovation, and or agile development practices? Um, so, I mean, the first, when people ask this question, the, the, there's a book I would highly recommend called uh, Digital Transformation um, and Formation at Scale. Um, this has been, uh, it's this one. Um, so I'll bring it up here. You can find it on Amazon, Digital Transformation at Scale. This is basically the, the story of um, the, U, the um, government digital service in the UK, um, but very candid and very sort of direct in its approach to like fixing um, sort of government bureaucratic processes, sort of getting you out of your own way so you can build this sort of thing. Um, I, I mean, I think you just have to stick to the values, right? You need to speak up in meetings and say, we should do this because it's the right thing, not because it's the thing that we've always done. Um, some of it will take a little bit of pushing of just, you know, if you can, if you can manage to, to, to start putting code on GitHub, even using your personal GitHub account, um, you know, of course, don't, don't share any secrets or, or personal information, but if, um, if it's something that can be open, you know, make it open, people will start to see the benefit of, uh, you know, something as mundane as just an issue tracking system being publicly accessible and the, the power of the hyperlink where you can just start linking things to people. 
um, they'll come around. The same thing applies for Google Docs. The same thing applies for anything that has a, a website URL. I think we tend to we tend to get focused on like we tend to lock everything up in this intranet, and we have these like phony URLs that don't even work in the real world, and we share information all internally. Um, you know, that's just not the way things are going to work in the 21st century, and we need to you know just start pushing the envelope more on that sort of thing. Um, so I would say you know aside from all the tooling and the actual process like it all boils back down to values. Um, we're open by default, we wanna document and disseminate. Um, if you really believe in those values and if you can start getting people um, aligned on them, like the, the rest will follow. Um, the, the, the technology platforms you put in place, the processes you put in place, uh, either support those values or they don't, and you should you know, modify them to, 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 you know, to support those values. Uh, David Knudsen says, uh, have you had to design for mobile devices and phones in particular? If so, what helps you deliver? Um, well, first and foremost, having a good designer with a lot of experience uh, is extremely helpful. Um, all of our apps are mobile responsive uh, just right out of the gate. It's not something we even spend any time thinking about um, as a special concern. It's just kind of always there. Um, so it's, it's not like we need to plan to make this thing mobile agile uh, or, or mobile responsive. Um, we all work across all different devices. Everything we build is that way. Um, so that helps just sort of taking that approach from the very beginning, but that doesn't come cheap. You need somebody that's got, you know, real experience designing for that sort of thing. Um, and um, I think, uh, yeah, we basically, you know, we best thing. Um, so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll actually set up structured sessions where we uh, look over people's shoulders as they use the app and trying to figure out the best way to, to have all these different interactions happen. It gets very, diff very, very tricky with web maps um, to get things to pop up in the right place and to get hover functionality. To, you know, hovering with a mouse is not a thing uh, on mobile devices. So there's, you know, there's a few different choices we had to make. Um, there's actually a great blog post um, on our blog by our, de our designer, Andy, uh, who talks about, you know, sort of the, the, the I guess, more or less stock um, mobile responsive web map that we've built that you see in a, a bunch of different places. So I'd check that out. Excellent, Chris. Excellent, uh, that's Chris, all uh, that's the questions all we have questions for, we have for uh, today's for webinar. webinar. I want to thank, I wanna everyone, thank again everyone again for their, for their attendance. attendance. I want to thank our presenter, Chris Wong, for excellent, for excellent, excellent, very informative, very informative uh, webinar sharing, sharing all the details, all the details uh, throughout, throughout, throughout the presentation as well as answering well the question too thoroughly. Um, right, we we'll look forward to forward seeing to our seeing recording, our recording the session, the session on our website. On our website. And, uh, and Chris, uh, Chris, uh, uh, you have anything to, everything uh, to, uh, to uh, add to uh, sign off? Sign off? Uh, no, just sort of stay the course. And um, you know, if you're trying to make change inside of government, I know it's hard, but uh, you know, keep keep fighting the good fight and uh, try and build build the best products you can build. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. And if we can, uh, get some uh, feedback, feedback from, from the attendees, the just, attendees to just to thank Chris for your time. Really appreciate, really that, appreciate before that before we sign off in the next minute. Hey Chris, thanks hey Chris, again. Thanks again, man. Yep, no problem. Take care. Talk to you later. Talk to you later. Yep. Take care. Bye bye.